Julius. Uh, thanks for being with us. You're here today to talk about uh, Cormac McCarthy, the American novelist. So I was wondering, could you maybe start by uh, telling us about your uh, interest in Cormac McCarthy and um, what what drew you to him? Well, just before I um, just before I finished my MA, actually, um, I I took a course uh, uh, with one of our professors, Dan O'Hara, um, at the University of Cologne. And we read Blood Meridian, and um, that was the first time I read Blood Meridian. I knew that at some point I, I would need to uh, to write on Cormac McCarthy, so this is how I got into um, into his work. Um, and I started reading uh, all of his novels, and at some point uh, did my PhD on him. I guess he's more known to the to the to the to the wider world for the adaptations of his novels. I mean, he's primarily a novelist. Um, he has written some plays um but is uh, probably most famous for the ones that have been uh, represented cin- cinematically so uh, i guess there we have uh, the road and uh, no country for all men probably is the most right. famous of all that's true it's always what you are uh, when you get asked what what you what you're working on and what you what you write about and 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 when you're doing stuff on Cormac McCarthy it's always at least for me and and other colleagues and scholars have said that it's always like, um, oh yeah, do you know the movie you No know, Country for Old Men or something like that? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> uh, um, and sometimes they do. Sometimes they know the the movie, and then oh, oh yeah, so the, there's a book before the mo- before the film. So sometimes that's an eye opener. Um, so they don't know the novelist at all. <laughs> yeah. So where would you place him in the uh, grand pantheon of uh, literary figures i mean like he's clearly somebody that you that you rate so i'm wondering what literary tradition is he in and uh, what's his status within the within i guess american literature i mean the literary tradition um that i would place him in um would i mean the people have uh, compared him to faulkner especially his early work has been compared to faulkner and then um, Melville, um, famously, um, McCarthy said that Moby Dick is his favorite uh, novel uh, or his favorite book. And um, so Faulkner and Melville, for sure, are um, are influences. There are many more influences um, um, on McCarthy. But w- what's interesting for me um, in terms of McCarthy is that he's so hard to... Um, Hard to place to begin with. He he uh, his work his work started at the same time that um, many people have um, periodized the, the literary tradition of postmodernism. So mid early sixties until the present, which seems to be like uh, the ideal way to to uh, place him in, in 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 literary American literary history, which is uh, literary postmodernism. But in 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 uh, my recently published book, um, I argue against that trend of placing him in, in that tradition of literary postmodernism because he, he's at odds, stylistically at least, with most of the literary um, uh, postmodernists that, that we know, such as Thomas Pynchon or Don DeLillo, for instance. What do you think makes him deviate from the postmodern tradition? What I find uh, that, that's important when, when thinking about McCarthy's work in terms of literary periods or... Um, or styles of writing, or a certain aesthetics, if you will, and the poetics, is that he seems to uh, reiterate not only um, modern or postmodern styles of writing, but most uh, literary periods or styles of writing from transcendentalism onwards. So he seems to integrate in a very problematic and difficult way, and in a way that that includes archaic uh, words like on every page of his novels, uh, that makes him like um, like an like the odd one out, if you will. So, for instance, there are no ironic language games that that we could really identify in his novels, for one. Or it's 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 not really that 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 he's interested in in a social critique um, of his time. That that um, that his novels are geared in in terms of the social engagement with the world especially the world in which he would write at the time in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But what is preva- prevalent in, in his poetics is a certain kind of ontological engagement, which, which, um, 
as I read his work and as I read like literary American literary history is is different from many postmodernists. You mentioned that it's the the very obvious thing there that he is in the uh, uh, he's an American writer. He's a, in in a, a distinct American literary tradition. You mentioned Faulkner, for example. Uh, I'm wondering, would you see him as a writer in conversation with more, uh, I guess, philosophical uh, American writers? Uh, I mean, you can think here of the American pragmatists, or you could think of Emerson, Thoreau. Do you think? Uh, how do you how do you see Cormac McCarthy fitting into the uh, American tradition of writing? Um, he's in conversation for sure with um, 19th century American uh, thinkers and writers such as Emerson and Thoreau and, and many Cormac McCarthy scholars have placed him in that tradition. Diane Lux, for instance, has written extensively about um, about that and many others. And some are veering toward an Emersonian reading of uh, McCarthy, others are tending toward placing him in a tradition together with specifically Thoreauvian and transcendentalism. But I think that what makes him really fascinating as a writer, that, that he is simultaneously uh, invested in, in, the local, in the locale, in the locality and in and, and regionalism, in American regionalism, and at the same time, this regionalism that is so important for him on a stylistic level is used or is a certain strategy to think about um, more universal, more metaphysical, more ontological questions that place him or that put him in a conversation with non-American thinkers. For instance, romanticist or idealist thinkers in the 19th century, for instance, in Germany, um, such as uh, Schelling or uh, the, the lesser known uh, Lorenz Oken. Um, I guess the one I'd like to sort of press you on is Thoreau. Thoreau is, uh, well, I mean, you know, he writes, he writes, uh, on civil disobedience. He's kind of, you know, the stereotypical American figure. You know, he, he rejects civilization. He rejects civ civility. There is an anarchistic streak in Thoreau. Uh, is this, uh, he, he advocates a type of return to nature and self-reliance and all of these, these, these very common themes. Is that something that you, you place McCarthy in regard to, or do you think it's something that he rejects? I would say yes and no. I mean, he um, um, he is he is part of that conversation uh, that that Thoreau is um, having with himself and with his readers and uh, with his environment in the 19th century in in in, in books like Walden and, and others. But the, the the question of civilization and anti-civilization and civil disobedience and so on and so forth. Is precisely a practical question. It's a que it's a question of ethics uh, in Thoreau, right? I mean, so many pragmatists are interested in in questions of metaphysics and nature and so on and so forth, but always from a certain pragmatic, that is to say, a practical uh, perspective or the the approach that uh, many pragmatists and the approach that that also um, most transcendentalists would have has a certain practicist. Uh, streak uh, to it, meaning that it's always important to to ask the question, what is nature? But that that question um, in both in Emerson and in, part in, in particular in Thoreau gets um, restated in terms of to what end is nature? Because in ethics and in met metaphysics, it's, it's kind of stated or proposed at the same time, because there's no metaphysical speculation for both Emerson and Thoreau, uh, without also a speculation on how to think community and so on and so forth. Whereas for McCarthy, not only not only is he a fiction writer, which which really complicates matters, as uh, literary scholars know, but but he is, but his work is sort of he, he obviates the step toward thinking uh, a practical approach. To aesthetics or to metaphysical questions of nature, and I think in his novelistic work he is aligned with the Schellingian metaphysics or ontology of nature that would precisely say, in order to think ethics, one needs to address questions of ontology first. Okay, so you 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 yeah you mentioned the word on ontology already, so I'm guessing you're using that in a sort of a standard sort of metaphysical sense that it's. 
Well, um, I mean, ontology and sort of the history of philosophy is about the study of being, uh, the study of the nature of reality. And in some sense, I think this is what you're saying, that for McCarthy, there is some kind of ontology in his in his work. There's a theory about the nature of reality or the reality of nature in some way. And that precedes ethical considerations. Exactly. There is. There's an an important, I mean, um, um, important for for, for uh, the book, important for the work on on McCarthy, the work that that I done there. There's an important um, concept called supervenience that I use in analytical philosophy. We have this notion of supervenience. One term supervenes upon another, and I use that in in the book to think how McCarthy uh, views ontology as something that comes first rather than second, uh, vis-a-vis ethics. So to think community, we need to think about what is nature first. And that that goes hand in hand with his um, disregard for ethical and political uh, engagement in his work or in his in his novelistic in his novelistic engagement in his in his literature. Yeah, basically, th- this is how I read his approach to to a philosophical understanding of what uh, literature might do. In a way, the, the question of what is nature or what is community, if we compare an ontological or an ethical or practical uh, approach to, uh, to philosophy, what I'm interested in here is how to think the philosophical question, uh, what is nature, from a literary standpoint. So, so in a way, his novels might be read in a way in which um, they provide provisional answers or uh, reiterations of that philosophical questions, but by literary means rather than by philosophical means. The philosopher who uh, I guess is a linchpin of your book Shreds of Matter is Schelling. Now, uh, one of the things that you do in your book is you say that a useful key for understanding what Cormac McCarthy is about is the branch of philosophy called German German idealism from 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 the eighteen hundreds. So uh, I wonder, maybe could you uh, speak about that a little bit? Um, Schelling, of course, was a, a philosopher of nature. Uh, I'm wondering, could you maybe mm-hmm. summarize, if that's possible, how you deploy Schelling to illuminate Carmen McCarthy's literary output? Well, that, that's a tall order, but I will, <laughs> I will try. I will try to say like a few sentences about this, uh, at least. The thing is that McCarthy has had huge success following following his is is um the adaptations of his novels but before that many from the um early 80s onward many scholars have started um reading and writing on McCarthy's work and there seems to be a consensus that that most McCarthy scholars excepting uh, some of them at least but um most McCarthy scholars would agree on and that is uh, that he is invested in a certain ecocentric uh, worldview or an ecocentric ethics, like an ethics that would say we need to be aware of our environment and so on and so forth. So rather than an egocentric standpoint, an ecocentric uh, standpoint is projected in uh, many of his narratives. And what's happening is that when when we think about nature in McCarthy's work, Sometimes the word ecology and the word or, or the concept of nature are either correlated or they are identified in the scholarship uh, on McCarthy. And 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 the more I read um, his work, I was kind of dissatisfied with that identification, if that makes sense. Right. So in in like early chapters um, of the book, I'm 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 arguing that. Eco-critical approach is is an important first step in thinking about um, McCarthy's engagement with uh, the question of what is nature, which is both um, a philosophical question, but it's it's also a question of ethics, a question of politics. Granted, uh, sure, we need to think about this question in terms of ethics and politics at some point, but for McCarthy, it starts with a metaphysical, ontological uh, question, together with an eco. Uh, centric approach at some point in the criticism in the scholarship there, there came like a slightly a slightly different or uh, an adjacent uh, approach if you will um, that I identified as a geocritical a geocritical perspective which would say that uh, 
certainly um, the environment or an ecological uh, approach to his work is important. But what was really at stake in, in McCarthy's uh, question of nature and his engagement with the non-human world as well is the question of what is space? How are we aligned as a community in, in, in spatial terms? Which, uh, if, if we follow, for instance, Fred Jameson's um, uh, um, definition of postmodernism, uh, that would make him an inherently postmodern writer, because postmodernism is all about uh, space and spacing, the spatial nature uh, of the social, for instance, which, which doesn't doesn't have to be the case. But I'm I'm just putting out here that geocriticism, in a sense, and and um, the term or uh, this kind of new school of criticism, if you will, is put is defined or is put forward by um, Bernard um, uh, Westphal, who is a critic who got translated by Robert Talley, who um, is also at the same university, incidentally, that the Comrade McCarthy archive is at, which is which is an interesting coincidence, actually. So that was a second step, or it was um, a parallel step in, in some way, like either in, 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 in McCarthy criticism. So either um, his concept of nature would be defined in terms of ecology or in terms of geology, in terms of space, right? But I was still kind of wondering how, how do we integrate his his uh, question, his questioning, and his his, his uh, literary answers, if you will, concerning the, the the question of what is nature. How do we integrate the identification of nature with ecology and and the identification of nature with space? How do we integrate um, that with McCarthy's simultaneous engagement with the histories of uh, religion and the histories of science? So also in the scholarship, there seems to be an either or camp. Either um, the critic at hand would be uh, engaged with McCarthy's fascination with science and the history of science, or the critic would be um, like interested in McCarthy's engagement with uh, mysticism, spiritualism, for instance, such as Petra Mundik would be an exemplary critic uh, in terms of this spiritualist um, uh, vein in McCarthy's studies. But at some point, I, I realized that it's not an American tr philosophical tradition that would be a neatly integrative, <laughs> if you will, um, philosophical framework, but, but it's a German tradition uh, called German idealism, but specifically uh, not German idealism in the Hegelian sense, but German idealism in the Schellingian sense, because for Schelling, the question, what is nature, is always a question that gets asked, even if that seems to uh, sound weird or contradictory, um, gets asked by nature itself, which means that for Schelling, there's a certain imminence to nature, so every, it's it's impossible to 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 state or to propose a being that would be unnatural. So for, for him, that nature is all encompassing, if you will, which makes every ontology um, that is worthwhile in, in Schelling's sense, an ontology that is grounded in nature, in the concept of nature. In your introduction, you say, in the introduction to Shreds of Matter, you make you right. make a right. very, very particular distinction, and it's a distinction that Schelling made. And you say there's a dis difference between nature practicing, its practicing itself rather than saying this or that about nature, or nature is this, or nature is X, you know, which would be kind of a very sort of mechanistic scientific view uh, I would imagine. So I'm wondering, how, how does that work for you uh, with regard to McCarthy? And, and that's a great aside here. I'm, I mean, for, for Schelling, the philosophy of nature, or what in German he calls specifically, um, not just Philosophie der Natur, but uh, Naturphilosophie means that as soon as you engage in this kind of practice of Naturphilosophie, of the philosophy of nature, it is nature philosophizing about itself. So in a way, the philosopher becomes a vessel for this natural process that at the same time as it self-analyzes, if you will, reconstructs or reproduces itself. So nature for Schelling is not only all-encompassing, but it is because even the philosopher of nature or the, the let's say, the American writers such as McCarthy, 
as this American writer would would write novels concerned with the question of nature, it is at this point that nature gets reorganized and reproduced and and remade in a, in, in a sense, in a very material sense. And that's what's really fascinating uh, in McCarthy's work and that which um, is really different from in, in terms of his poetics, his aesthetics, his um, philosophical engagement. Um, this is how he really uh, has to be differentiated uh, from a lot of his contemporaries, because this is precisely the question that his novels are. They are about certain things. They are coming of age narratives that take place in the Southwest or or in Knoxville and so on and so forth. But they are also novels of something, not not merely about something, right? So in a sense, um, his novels are reiteration of that about which these novels are in the first place, if that makes sense. Uh, it does, yeah. I mean, <laughs> to a certain degree. So. <laughs> um, the philosophical concept of imminence has been proposed so many times already, especially in French philosophy, for the past 50 years or so. So when you say imminence, you mean, uh, sorry to cut across you, Julius, just so we can kind of uh, get a sense of the technical terms. Um, imminence is usually connected to notions of materialism and that there is mm-hmm. uh, there are only material explanations of nature. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, as opposed to say uh, religious or spiritual or transcendent, right? Um, and it would be odd to to combine that with um, this kind of German idealism, uh, the streak of German, this nature philosophical streak of idealism that I just reiterated here, and um, that would also be at odds with McCarthy's poetics, uh, given that that he's really interested also in, in the question of uh, of the divine and so on and so forth whether or not the divine exists. And um, maybe we should also, um, I would be really interested to, to, to hear your take on the question of, of the divine and of atheism maybe in McCarthy's work. But what, what's interesting, like in, in my reading of, of these matters, is that given that nature is uh, all encompassing from this Schellingian point of view, and also, as I would argue, from, from the point of view projected in McCarthy's uh, narratives in his novels, right? Arguing that nature is all encompassing would mean that even the spiritual is part of this material world that that, that is nature, which which um, would then also entail that materialism or the material does not have to be or should not be equated, at least in in in, in our case, with uh, with corporal reality. So usually in materialism. Or in a certain uh, materialism that that you just uh, referred to, it's it's always materialism in a sense of material um, as corporeal uh, or as stuff. Yeah, exactly, as stuff, material stuff, as opposed to um, spirituality or the ideal or the divine and so on and so forth, right? But for McCarthy and 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 for Schellingian uh, philosophy of nature, also the divine, also or so um, the spiritual, the mystical. All, all of these uh, matters are part of this material reiteration and so uh, and that, that goes on and on in in the process of thinking nature it's, it's kind of a two-way street for for Schelling in philosophy of nature the phrase thinking nature would would uh, refer to a certain philosopher that would think nature but as soon as the philosopher or the the, the artist, if you will, would think nature. The process of thinking nature would also mean a nature that thinks itself. That 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 is kind of the the, the gist of the argument here in terms of the philosophy of nature that I think is um, at the core of of, of McCarthy's, if, if if you would say that, like philosophical impetus or also his poetics. Given that you are writing uh, very much in the tradition of German idealism. The way you lay that out makes sense to me because I mean, one of what is what is sort of long before deconstruction and postmodernism, German idealism was the great sort of um, collapser of binaries. Mm-hmm. You know, freedom is necessity, spirit and matter are not separate uh, domains, mind and body are entwined in some way. Mm-hmm. So, I don't think that I don't think that's sort of you know, sort of too con- controversial. What I'm interested in, I guess, is in McCarthy is that how he's bringing these two these two domains uh, together. I mean, for me, when it comes to sort of questions of whether is McCarthy an atheist or is he a materialist or whether he is a 
a, a spiritualist or a vitalist. Mm-hmm. To me, they seem to uh, to miss the point. And I think that's what you're, you're, you're trying to do there. You're, you're saying, how does McCarthy's work think nature? Mm-hmm. Uh, and how does it overcome these these binaries? But the question would be, uh, how does he um, go about it in the novel, in the novels themselves? Or, or what's the question? Yeah, how does he, well, how is that, uh, how is how is that manifest in the novels themselves? I mean, I think like with, with, with McCarthy, given that you talk about nature, I mean, mm-hmm. when we think nature, McCarthy's got this Schellingian vein in his work mm-hmm. what is what does what does that nature look like well, i don't think we could really say that mccarthy is giving us uh, an idyllic pastoral vision exactly yeah exactly i mean like pastoralism even though scholars have have uh have, have written uh, many articles and 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 some books about pastoralism in mccarthy's uh work in his in his um in, in his literary vision I, I, I don't think pastoralism is is um, is the last word on on the question of what is nature in McCarthy's work. In in, in my reading um, of his work, I I have like certain pairings of novels, and I start with um, his early work, The Orchard Keeper uh, from the mid '60s, and then Child of God and Sutri. These three novels I um, I read in terms of allegory on the one hand. So allegory seems to be um, a literary device and also tradition in, in, in literature, but also a tradition in, in uh, theological narratives, as you know. Um, and and I use this this notion of allegory vis-a-vis a notion of what uh, Schelling calls in his later work, following Coleridge, by the way, tautigory, that might ring a bell for everyone who's who's interested or invested in in the philosophy of Leotard, who. In, in his later um, in his in his in his later work, especially his book on on Kant, who talks about the uh, the notion of the tautigorical or of tautigory, and I have this pairing of allegory on the one hand and tautigory on the other to to um, to think about how do we um, address these these highly metaphysical and as some would say in a derogatory manner highfalutin <laughs> conceptions, right? Uh, metaphysical conceptions. How does it work out in in the novels themselves, as you just said? Also, and I think in in the Orchard Keeper, uh, uh, for instance, there are certain words that occur for the first time in in that in that first novel uh, of his. Certain phrases and words that come up again and again in his later um, uh, novels, such as, for instance, supplication, and supplication is a concept or it's, it's, it's a word that denotes uh, a certain posture, a certain uh, begging for mercy in, in the face of uh, death, for instance, right? Begging for, begging, uh, for mercy in, in the face of grief and so on and so forth. So begging for one's own mercy or for the, in, for the sake of others. The notion of supplication is something that on the one hand, it's allegorical in the sense in which the, the certain locale in which the narrative is placed in, right? Appalachia, right? In, in, in the Orchard Keeper kind of makes a grander or m- more universal statement about human nature, which, which could be argued for uh, many novels in, 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 uh, McCarthy's oeuvre. But then, there's a certain quality to some of those phrases that get reiterated again and again. It's either supplication or the supplicant, for instance. And this other quality would point to a certain dimension that is imminent in, in terms of the oeuvre and then also in terms of um, the certain writing style in which it, in which it is imbricated. And the, the notion uh, of, of allegory, one thing for another, um, is something that that Schelling, in in his later work on mythology and on religious texts, uh, rejected. He said religious texts are not powerful because they say one thing but mean an, another thing. But religious texts and and mystical texts are so powerful because they mean exactly what they're uh, saying. And that's what I'm arguing that that this is precisely how a certain uh, philosophy of nature. Is manifested in, on a stylistic literary uh, kind of level in in McCarthy's early work, and then also in his later work. But that's like the first 
more analytical chapter in the book that I'm saying, like in the Orchard Keeper, uh, whenever um, we read about a certain kind of, for instance, in, in the Orchard Keeper, mute supplication, one of the supplicants in Child of God, for instance, is the one who will drink the, the blood of the nameless child, for instance. So um, these phrases uh, crop up again and again in, 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 in various manners. And um, this is precisely this totigorical um, and self-reflexive um, um, mode of, of, of McCarthy's narratives. One of the things that McCarthy is known for, or one of the things that is most synonymous with his work is this notion of uh, violence. I mean, if you, you only need to think of uh, Blood Meridian, which is perhaps one of the most violent, goriest, bloodiest novels uh, ever, ever, ever written. Now, I'm wondering, uh, with, in this discussion of nature, how does that link to the question of violence for you, or does it? Uh, it does, for sure. I mean, on a stylistic level, there's also this uh, the genre of the Southern Gothic, and many uh, scholars have I've written about McCarthy in, 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 in terms of the Southern Gothic and American Gothic literature, uh, in general. And the Gothic. So you mean like a horror writing? Horror, horror fiction. Also, there are some who have, um, aligned him with kind of weird literature, like H.P. Lovecraft and so on and so forth. So what, what, what's interesting here with, with the aspect or the all prevalent aspect of violence in McCarthy's novels is that, um, I would read that as a stylistic trait in, in his uh, work, also in order to think about how can we make sense of how, how can we make sense of the way in which things hang together, uh, the, the way in which kind of the corporeal and the incorporeal may be pondered. To to rephrase some of some of the sentences in in the Orchard Keeper, right? That the world beyond. The world beyond men, or something, right? And, and the orchard keeper that, that he is interested in, uh, when Uncle Ether, for instance, is near the end, <laughs> right? And, uh, toward the ending of the, the first novel. The notion of violence so prevalent because McCarthy is interested in, in a certain both philosophical and literary uh, move that inquires into the ground of, of things and inquires and, and examines how how certain human bodies, non-human bodies, may be disassembled in order to um, to see how how they were made. And this is also a phrasing that comes up again and again in um, both in, in Child of God, for instance, and in the Road. The destruction of the world in the Road, which gets projected. Um, it's, it's not only that the world is already a world of ash and so on and so forth. That's floating around um, in the air, but toward the ending of that novel, what we get is is um, the image, the imagery of a, a word that of a, of a world that would um, be known uh, by its dispersion, if you will. And this is a very romantic uh, imagery, of course, that there's only um, a knowing of things in in their disruption. Would, would you read violence in, in his work in a similar manner? or I guess with McCarthy, the thing with violence is that it reflects uh, the broader material structures of the world, the broader geological structures of the world, uh, the broader environmental structures of the world in some sense. In, in some sense, he's saying that, to me at least, that, uh, that, that violence isn't resident. And this is probably speaks to what you're talking about, that he's not offering a pastoralism, you know. If, 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 if anything, he's offering the direct opposite. It's anti-Edenic. Right, exactly. Violence among humans are a reiteration of violence among non-human uh, uh, forces that, that are also uh, that predate uh, human history. That, that's that's really what, what's uh, what's at stake here. Without him being like a straight naturalist in in, in, in the sense of literary naturalism, it's it's not like like a Darwinian one force against another force. It's more like a reiteration or a recapitulation of a natural process, but also in 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 in, in this this kind of process of dissolution, not, not just a reiteration of natural process in terms of uh, um, creativity or regeneration. So um, he's really part of those writers um, that Slotkin um, has framed in, in terms of this kind of regeneration through violence, I would say. How do you think 
the concept of nature as you conceive it in McCarthy, how do how is how does that work itself out through the characters? Is there psychological consequences? Is that something that you've detected uh, across uh, McCarthy's oeuvre? The idea that in some way there are psychological effects to the order of nature as you conceive it. With uh, some of his novels, I have detected, like in, in, in some of the characters there, I have detected like a, a nature philosophical strand called panpsychism. So that that either even though or a certain version of panpsychism, uh, like an all encompassing psyche uh, in the material world. So on the one hand, like nature is all encompassing in in in, in Schelling and, and McCarthy's point of view, but that would also mean if if the um, if the spiritual uh, dimension is is then also part of this natural world, we need to account for this, right? And um, in in characters such as Kola, for instance, in in Outer Dark, who who has this kind of weird relationship to uh, the the what is called the Grim Triune, if you remember, who will um, at some point. Uh, murder his uh, nameless child. There's, there's been a lot of writing uh, going on and uh, publishing going on uh, about this question whether or not the Grim Triune are um, separate agents, like um, separate characters who are not to be identified with color as a character, or whether um, they are like a psychological projection uh, of his de- desires, for instance, and so on and so forth. So th- the question would be, in what sense uh, can we equate the, the question of psychology, of character psychology, with a certain, what may be called a physiocentric uh, continuum, a, a certain kind of all-encompassing physiology that would include uh, the psychological, that would include character psychology. This is something that, that is important also in terms of how McCarthy um Describes his characters as indifferent to uh, to uh, to violent behavior and um, to the sight of violence and war and 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 and, and related matters, especially in in Blood Meridian. Well, the judge character is the 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 the, the avatar of uh, exactly the, of the idea that nature is 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 war. Yes, in in, in Blood Meridian, but then also in in No Country for Old Men, um, Shigur, the killer. Um, would be would be a, a similar um, character, I would say. The question is whether or not he is uh, a character that 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 reiterates a, a mechanistic or mechanical understanding of of natural process, or whether or not he's part of this um, dynamism, if you will. Right. The um, that that would be the question. I mean, in 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 the book, the um. I read No Country for Old Men in in um, in a particular manner that has to do with mythology or mythography. It wouldn't be controversial to say that Carmen McCarthy's writing is, and you said this already. You know, it's very much embedded in sort of archaic ideas of what it means to be a human being. It's right. very, it's very. His writing is full of uh, mythological reference. His writing is full of biblical allusion. Um, right. Yet at the same time, we know this, that McCarthy is exceptionally interested in the most advanced levels of scientific inquiry. Exactly. So I'm wondering for you, how does his literature reconcile these these, these, these two urges, you know, science and religion, science and myth? I've already kind of allu- alluded to... Um the productive alignment of um, German philosophy of nature and his poetics, precisely because of this uh, this combined effort to th- to think through the history of science and and the history of religion or of mysticism, um, which is exactly what's happening in his narratives. But in but one of the ways in which various narratives, um, not just written by McCarthy, have been have been dealing with the question of what is nature or how how does the the process of nature work is uh, by means of mythology or mythography as we could also say the 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 writing of myths right and there are two figures that are important for McCarthy's attempts to to think through uh, that question in mythological terms and those are the the the, the two 
figures of Orpheus and Prometheus. And I read especially his later work, but also some of his earlier work um, in, in terms of that conceptual um, backdrop, right? So there are many characters who would tend toward a Promethean understanding um, or Prometheanist understanding of the question of what is nature and how does nature play itself out. And then also an Orphic or Orphean uh, tradition that is projected in some of his characters. So Orphism being kind of to really simplify it here, and I'm, I'm, I'm using Pierre Hadot's work. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Pierre Hadot, like the yeah, the uh, Stoic uh, philosopher, yeah, or the yeah, the yeah, what is ancient philosophy? Exactly. Guy, yeah. So, so he 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 had written like um, an important book called The Veal of Isis, where he um, talks about the the, the the question of how does nature uh, get conceptualized in in in, in Western philosophy um, and and culture and literature and so on. Or um, going back to Heraclides, right? How do we um, think through the question? Um, nature hides itself, and how how can we access this nature that is hiding? And he proposes these two figures as kind of then also figurations of how to go about answering that question. And I think McCarthy's work has so many characters that either attend toward the tradition of orphism that would be um, engaged in, in a kind of kind of bemoaning a past that is lost, a certain kind of conservatism also, and so on and so forth. Uh, the world of art that is a repetition of the past, of past glories and so on. And and then also a certain kind of dealing with grief in, in his novels that is important, especially in, in um, the Border Trilogy, right? There are there are some of the main characters there. John Grady, for instance, um, has an Orphic, uh, has an, an, an Orphic character or a characteristic quality to uh, to him. Whereas people like uh, Shigur are Promethean characters who are who project a certain uh, scientific or also scientistic and different view of the world. And that view of the world would then be projected. Uh, into the future. This is really a certain kind of binary that I think is productive uh, vis-a-vis McCarthy's uh, dealing with the question of mythography. I only have uh, two more uh, questions for you, Julius. One rather easy, I guess. But the first one, I think, is I'm wondering... When you comment in your book on uh, Raymond Williams, you say that uh, you know that within McCarthy there's a structure of feeling, which is one of Raymond Williams' terms. Right. And uh, you say very quickly that in McCarthy the feeling is sorrow, loneliness, isolation, despair, distress. So I'm wondering, although I I I, I think I, I I don't think that's what what McCarthy is famous for. You know, he's got a very bleak outlook on on, on what the human being is and what they can achieve. But I don't think that's just in evidence in uh, McCarthy, and I think you make this point as well that you you kind of say that there's sort of moments of transcendence, meaning. Uh, there's moments of uh, even some kind of uh, weird redemption in McCarthy. So I'm wondering, could you talk about that a, a little bit? What I would call a certain kind of, for lack of a better word here, uh, a certain kind of poetological, but also a narrative formula that that in a very creative way he's reiterating, reiterating is what I call like if I remember correctly, in the books, starting uh, from grief and then arriving at grace at some point, which is also in alignment with uh, some of the uh, sentiments expressed in in Schelling's um, freedom essay, right? The philosophical investigations uh, that are concerned with human freedom. So I think that he, most of his novels, even though it's like, sometimes it's like uh, violence all the way through and and death and destruction, right? The poetic and then the, the, the narrative uh, movement is um, is always in between those two polarities, grief and grace. And most of the time, it starts from grief and it arrives at grace, which is not to say that there is a happy ending sort of teleology to his, his novels at all. But I think there is a certain progression that that we kind of lived through also as readers precisely because McCarthy has so many coming of age narratives. So it's, it's always a certain development, e- e- even though many of his characters are like really bleak characters, like in, in, in a sort of mirror image uh, of, um, of their environments. 
and and sometimes there's like sheer indifference that 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 uh, these characters kind of embody, but still there's a narrative movement that doesn't really have a redemption uh, uh, moment, but it it kind of moves towards a certain kind of graceful indifference, we could say maybe graceful indifference. That's uh, that's very beautiful. Yeah, yeah, sort of a sort of a, sort of a serene nihilism. Yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's. Not, a, I think that's Junger's term. I think, if I recall, I'm not sure. Ernst Junger. Right, that might be an interesting reading of Blood Meridian uh, vis-à-vis Junger. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be told another time. I think. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, should be an interesting PhD project for someone. The uh, <laughs> the uh, the last question I want to ask you is: uh, What's your favorite Cormac McCarthy book? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a good one. I mean, um, it's a good question, difficult question. Like for me, um, like with um, with novelists, but also with music, when I really uh, get to get to love the, the work of of uh, certain bands or musicians or or novelists or poets or what have you, right? Sometimes it's really kind of the the, the first book or the, the first album that you listen to. So. In a sense, it would have to be Blood Meridian. On the other, like with a little bit of distance, though, I would say um, one of his absolute greatest novels, absolutely greatest um, achievements is Out of Dark. But um, um, that assessment might change uh, uh, like For sure. in the near future. Uh, but Blood Meridian will always be um, a very important um, uh, very important book because like when the the reading experience back then um i think it was 2010 or 2011 was really like i was thinking well like when i read those first three or four pages it was like it was like the um the sensation was almost like as if i would like crawl through dirt <laughs> you know what i mean like and, and that was a great experience because i'd never um had that feeling while reading a novel, so um, so that was really powerful. But Outer Dark, I really, you know, I, I, anyone who hasn't read uh, Outer Dark yet, uh, you should really uh, read read this um, second novel of his. You know, Julius Grab, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. That was uh, was really great. Thanks. <laughs>